Hey guys, brand new BirdCast. And the Hot Summer Nights Tour is back on the road October 7th in Salt Lake City, Utah. We are doing all outdoor venues, um, some of which are drive-in movie theaters, some of which are just straight outdoor venues where you can kind of hang out. They're all really, really cool. And, uh, and I've kind of vetted them to make sure that you can go out and party and you're not stuck in a car. So check me out, Salt Lake City on the 7th, Grand Junction's on the 8th, Colorado Springs on the 9th, October 12th in Prescott, Arizona, the 13th on Santa Fe. That is when I have a cardiologist appointment where I should probably uh, change that. Good call. A big announcement on the 15th of October. I can't tell you yet, but if you listen to Two Bears, One Cave Live next Monday, you will hear it. Houston, Texas on the 16th, San Antonio on the 17th, Dallas, Fort Worth on the 18th, on the 20th, St. Louis, Missouri, Toledo, Ohio on the 21st, Cleveland, Ohio on the 22nd, and on the 23rd at Hoffman Estates, Illinois, big announcement coming tomorrow about my... (laughs) Anyway, I just picked my nose. New Two Bears, One Cave is live, is out right now with Bobby Lee, Bobby Lee. Will be a part of my who's announcement tomorrow. No, 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 in a, in a couple of weeks, just kidding. We do actually do, but we haven't aired it yet. It'll be for if in case one of us um, can't make it, we need to cover ourselves. And by the way, he's just an American. I don't identify. I don't. I, I identify. Never mind. Let's just move forward. Okay, it's Tim Dillon. All right. So, <laughs> uh, great podcast today. We have some announcements. You'll hear them throughout the podcast. Thank you, everyone, for your support. Thank you for this. Two, new two, uh, uh, Bill Burt is out right now. Um, new Two Bears, One Cave with Bobby Lee is out right now. The tour starts October 7th. What else do you need to know? What else do you need to know? Um, I am done my series in Macon, Georgia. I am home. We are wrapping up these Zooms. By the time I get home in October, my new podcast studio will be up and running. I have actually thought, Halston, I wonder if what we should do just to make it totally safe is put a barrier up while we're doing the um, coronavirus episodes so we can smoke and drink and party and get irresponsible, but know that we're safe. I was wondering about that. I wonder if we should do that. Make it so you can't see it the way like they do a tiger in a movie, you know? Or like Hollywood squares, like a close up. Yeah, maybe. maybe. <laughs> a box. Or we can just sit kind of further apart. Or, because I don't think I want to get everyone tested for every episode. I do want to have people over new podcast studio. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. We got a lot of, I got to go get a root canal right now. I'm doing this read. I talk about the root canal at the end of this. This is a great podcast. This is a great, great podcast. He's got a new Netflix special called Asian mama, Mexican kids. Um, it's awesome. I watched it the other day while I was in Macon when we were going to supposed to do the podcast like a week ago. And then, and, uh, and I will tell you, I will tell you that I bring this up. His daughter L King comes out at the end and, Fucking God, that kid was blessed with some fucking chords. Her voice is magical. And Robin Hurst saying, nah, just watch it yourself. Watch it yourself. It's streaming right now on Netflix. But we have a great conversation. Um, you know, you, I, it's interesting. I, I talked to him about this. We talked when he was on Mark Maron's podcast. I remembered, uh, I remembered that he was a comic. It's so funny. Some of these guys get so famous and they do such big movies. He's been in. Almost every Sandler movie, you, the Deuce Bigelow, which we talk about, which is probably my favorite part of the conversation. So I wanted to talk to him about um, about how he got that made because his his best friend made it with him. And I always wondered, like, if you have like if you have a best friend like like that, I guess it's so funny. I get I guess I do have really close friends like that, and I don't. I never ask anything of them. Like I don't ever ask. I try not to ask for things from Joe. I will ask to be on a show if I have a special coming out, but I know that Joe would expect that of me, you know, that he'd be like, yeah, why didn't you ask me? Um, But it is crazy. I wondered about that. And so we talk about the making of Deuce Bigelow, which I think what people may forget was a fucking smash hit. Like if you're younger and you don't remember Deuce Bigelow, I saw it in the movie theater with my dad. The reason I bring this up is he's only laughed at two movies ever in his life. And it's, 
Something about Mary and Deuce Bigelow. He cried laughing in Deuce Bigelow. It was a fucking hilarious movie. We talk about that. We talk about him um, and, and Sandler and Spade and the whole group of them and Chris Rock. We talk a lot about that. It's a great, 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 great conversation. But we talk mostly about the fact that, like, we him growing up in San Francisco. But we talk about comedy, and that is, and I will tell everyone, if you get the chance, go back and listen to his podcast with Mark Marin because I think I forgot that he was just a comic one day. Like, when he got into this business, he just wanted to be a comedian, just like me. And I identified with him so much. Okay, I really got to go now. I'm running late to this root canal, and I got to brush my teeth. I identified with him so much on Marin's podcast because I was like, oh, he's everything I was. Just wanted to be a comic. And then the business was different at that time. He didn't start a podcast. He just got on SNL and made movies, and did the road a little bit, and now he's doing the road again, and now he's been focused on stand-up for 10 years, and he has this great special Asian mama Mexican kids, which you should check out on Netflix right now. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'm going to get a root canal. Without further ado, stand-up comedian, Rob Schneider. He's the man. It's such a fucking honor. Oh, thank you. I don't know That's if I could live up to that, buddy, but thank you. Likewise, you're killing it, man. You're 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 the the every man I've been trying to be for thirty years, and you're you're the real thing. <laughs> That's not true at all. <laughs> no, man. People love you. They, they, I, I, all I've I've just wanted to make a career, Bert, and you, you hit it harder than me. Was this? <laughs> I want to say, like, you know, my life's not that great, but look at that guy. He's got real problems, and that's that's you, yeah, that's your zone, man. I've got, I've, I've, uh, I've carved out that nook for me. <laughs> it's working. Don't fight it. The, uh, I wanted, there's so much I want to talk to you about the first one. I've, for, I don't even know where to start, but, uh, the, I, you know, it's so funny. I heard you on Marin a while back. Was that how, how long ago was that? Oh gosh, it could have been four years ago or so, maybe five. I listened to it on an airplane and it's so funny that, and it, which is so cool about your Netflix special is that, in hearing you talk, the, my only takeaway was, God damn it, I forgot he was a comedian. Like, I <laughs> forgot. I could have forgot you're a straight-up stand-up comic. That's who you are. Those are who you – you've been so in movies and in SNL and characters and, and, like, I mean, you've had so many different – you've worn so many different hats in this business. Well, oh, he's just a comic. At, at, at the base of things. Yeah, absolutely. That was the start of everything. I, I just thank you. Cause I mean, cause that was the, um, I mean, that was it. I mean, when, when I saw like, you know, I saw George Carlin perform in like in 1974, maybe no, no, wait a minute. No. It could have been 76 or 77. And, um, but it was like early, like I was like 12 or something like that. And, um, and I just, I was dying. We were literally in Hawaii cause that's what my grandfather's from. Uh, lived in Hawaii. We were literally in the last row. It was like my dad, my brother, and me in the last row of this auditorium. And he just comes out and says, would you like a nice Hawaiian punch? No. Would you like a nice New York kick in the balls? And, uh, <laughs> and that's the only thing I remember from that evening, but we were dying the whole night. And, uh, but I never thought you could do it for a living until a couple of years later when, uh, and I, I heard that there was, uh, you know, the Steve Martin was going to be coming to San Francisco. So we, we went to go see him. And then that's when I put it together. I was like, dude, that guy's in the same, I mean, he, I mean he's in the same room. He's, he's on the stage and in, in, a, in an auditorium. But like, I mean, he did it. He's a person. I'm a person. You know, you kind of have to think yeah. like that. You know? It's and, funny. Yeah, I saw well, there was a comedy club in Tallahassee at a Holiday Inn when I was in college. And I remember, um, seeing a comic, I ended up heckling him, but it was, but I didn't know that. I didn't know what it, I did. I, it was back when you, before you were a comic and you thought as long as the room's laughing, that's all that anyone matters, but that's, you know, that, all that yeah. matters. His punchline was a styrofoam cooler. That was his punchline. I was in the front row with my buddy, Eddie, and we were on dates yes. and he goes, and it's, it's a, there were, it's a styrofoam cooler and it's silent, right? Silent. And he's yeah. holding it. And it's so like five seconds later, I hit my buddy Eddie in a in an, a loud whisper. I go, "Oh, styrofoam cooler!" And the place went nuts. Right? 
Yeah, yeah. And the guy looked at me and was livid. And at that point, I didn't. I was like, how did he do the magic trick of getting up there? And then I went back to try to talk to him after about how do you become a comedian? And he was so nasty to me. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny is that there, there are the guys that were like super mean to you when you first start. Like yeah. I remember like there was a, um, I was just starting to open nights open mic nights at the other cafe, which was really cool because it was like that, you know, like, like Marin, I'm sure talked about, like, it was like the hippie part, the hate Ashbury in San yes. Francisco. And, uh, so you had really cool people come in. Literally sometimes you would have Grace slick would come in from like, um, yeah, you know, uh, we built this city. Yeah. Well, hopefully from like uh, the white rabbit more than that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, that was the first concert I ever saw. She was oh, doing yeah. Whitney Houston. <laughs> that was when it was called was it? Oh, Jefferson Airplane. Yeah. And it was called St Jefferson Starship. And then just called Starship. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, and I just remember like being weirded out by her because, you know, just an older woman talking to me. I thought, I, is she hitting on me? I don't know. And see, her eyes were like, like this, you know, like she had like, like she really did take some of that stuff. And so, but it was a cool place to perform and the audiences were, were, you know, if you tried to do different stuff, they would go farther with you. And then I remember going up with, there was the MC and I said, and some, um, he said, I'm going to, I'm the hosting. And he said, good night. I'm going to be hosting, uh, uh, the, uh, Sunday nights at, uh, uh, at the punchline. It was another club in San Francisco, great club. And I went up to him and I said, so how do I get in there, uh, to sign up for, uh, the punchline? He said, who came up to you? Who told you, to, who told you to, Talk to me and hit me up for this. Who told you? And I went, like, well, I just you know, heard you say it. No, who told you? And I said, well, you told me that you just said it, you know. And he was just a dick. And, um, but then the opposite were the greatest guys were the guys, like the, the guys who were really good at it were the guys who were also the most generous with their information, you know? Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Like all the, like, um, like, like when Jerry Seinfeld came to town, we, you know, all the comedians, we'd go see him at Cobb's Pub, which is nothing but a bar, but they could get like 140 people and you're paying 10, 15 bucks. It made it worth it for him to do four shows or whatever. And, uh, and after he would just, you know, we'd sit there and he'd talk to us and he'd lecture us, uh, you know, and, you know, because that's what we wanted. Of course. He, yeah. You guys got to take the swear words out. <laughs> if you take the swear words out and it's not funny then it's not funny. <laughs> and I remember like, wow, that was great. He said, you can't swear on tonight show. Why, why would you want to do that? And it just, you needed somebody to like, cause you know, who was the first person to tell you how to like get a set together and like get five minutes and like. Patrice O'Neill. Oh yeah. Well, he Patrice, was a master. But no, but, but what I was doing it, I was doing it. Like I had all my things written on a set list. Yeah. And, and we were, we had to do, I want to say 15 minutes. I know it wasn't 15 minutes because I don't think I had 15 minutes then. Maybe it was like 12 minutes. We had to do 12 yeah. minutes. And so I had my jokes written out all on a set list. By the way, I still do that to this yeah. day. But I don't, what I did is I put it on the stool. We were at Caroline's and I basically looked and I told the joke that I saw and there was no cohesion to it. Okay. And we were doing two shows. We were recording them to be submitted for a festival, uh, Edinburgh. And we were part of the thing. And Patrice goes, oh, is that your set list? And I said, yeah. And he goes, can I see it? And I went, yeah. And he grabbed it and he ripped it up and he threw it away. And he goes, don't read your jokes off a list. He goes, if you don't know them, and if he goes, you're not that comic. You're a comic that should be in the moment, flowing, going from one joke to the other. And if it doesn't go in the exact order, it doesn't need to. It can just be what it is. And I went, yeah, okay. And so just based on panic and energy, I went up and did it that way. And I have never been able to look at a set list. Like I'll write my jokes out. Yeah. Like when I do a special, I'll put them, I'm trying to see if I have them floating around here, but I'll put them on set lists and like have them all there. But I, I never go through a set list. That's just to jar my memory before the show. No, but it is. But also like, cause I'm doing a new hour and literally it's, it's a weird thing. Cause you know, when you have like uh I just, you know, I recorded it like literally it was like right before the world shut down. Yeah. I think I was the last comedy special that was filmed February 29th. Wow. And at that time, uh, you know, in 2020, it was like, it was starting to get a little weird 
is Adam Sandler and I were about to go do like literally hockey stadiums. I mean, uh, you know, just me and him doing like, you know, 15,000 seaters. And he, he called me up a couple of days later after I filmed it. He said like, do you think we should go out? It's, you know, cause when the Tom Hanks got it, that was like the beginning. And then the, and then the NBA canceled their season and they're like over. Yeah. And I just got it in. I remember like somebody, um, was saying, uh, I'm kind of uncomfortable, you know, on, on the, one of the, uh, social medias, I'm kind of uncomfortable being around a lot of people right now. Are you going to reschedule? And I'm like, for what? No, I've spent it. We got like crew and like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't even think about it, you know? So, but we got it in. So, but what I, I was getting to that from, um, was having, thank God we got that done. And then, then I just threw all that material away and it was good. It's like, uh, you know, um, I, th- I guess the, uh, Jews call it mikvah. You know, you just take a cleansing bath and get all that stuff out of you and get it off you. Yeah. And then I, so, um, it's, there's so much happening in the world right now that I think, uh, I wanted to just talk about it. So I just wrote it down and it just, and I did have a list and I had a seven pages and I said, you know, you're charging money to, for people to come see you. But I said, I said, I think it's gonna, I, wor- I did work it out and, and like, but you do have to kind of, and then, and then I think at the end of the day, I know what you're talking about though, Bert, is when you have the list in your pocket or backstage or whatever, but you don't have to look at it because it's in there. Yeah. But the, the idea of like kind of security blanket thing. Oh, security yeah. blanket. I, you know what I do? This is a hardcore secret. I don't think anyone has ever noticed. I, when I do a, when I do a special, I will write my list and magic marker on the stool in a, in a paint pen. I'll write the list. Wow, and I'll that's the genius. Yeah, so that way, that way, if, if I do, cause you know, you know, when you get to a part and you're like, you like get to a part of your act and you're like, this should be 33 minutes. And then you look down and you're like 25. Oh fuck. I forgot something. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. You know, but, yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, that's a great idea, but the, I just remember like, cause I was going to, I wanted to do my special and I remember being there. I was, uh, opening for Adam Sandler for, and he was doing his special and I had a part in it with him and Chris Rock was backstage and Kevin James was backstage. And I remember Chris was very animated. And he was saying, fuck the show. Fuck the show. It ain't about the show. It's about the special. Get the special. Fuck yeah. the show. Get the special. In other words, make sure if you have to stop everything and do something or redo or whatever, just you got to get it. And that's what Sandler was talking to me about, which kind of, because I told him I was going to shoot one. And he said, uh, man, it's weird. The difference between us comedians and musicians. Like my daughter, L. King, she gets to work a year on her album. We get one night two shows. Yeah. You know, I mean, luckily, well, Adam, his show, he filmed it for a year. I spent like, you know, uh, millions of dollars on it. Can I tell you that's the, that is, that should, so does Chappelle. I mean, I'm not, I shouldn't speak for Chappelle, but like from what I understand from executives, Chappelle, his first special back, I think he shot like 18 shows or something. Like he yeah. shot like eight shows. And I, when I did my last special, I was like, Hey, I, two shows is not enough. Like yeah. it just isn't. And, and they were like, well, we can add two shows. I was like, yeah, how much? And they were like 50 grand. And I was like, uh, hold on. So just for <laughs> perspective, anyone listening, a, a special is going to cost maybe 350, $700,000. Yeah. But just to add one more night for me was 50 grand. I was like, take it out of my fucking what they're paying me. Oh, and yeah, yeah. definitely I will. De- Cause you look at Sandler's Sandler's yeah. was, phenomenal but you realize how many cuts he got at it as a comic you go he is just showing you every fucking dinger off the wall well that's that right tour, what, which what, is what, amazing and well, look, what, what adam is, is what 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 every comedian can learn from adam sandler is what you can do your art form and stand-up and performing is one thing that is one aspect of it your yeah. writing of it is another aspect you're performing your performance is another aspect and the look of it. But the one thing that like what every comedian who's, who's uh, uh, like us and every comedian who wants to do this art form and wants to do it at the highest level, you got to know he's also a filmmaker. Yeah. He's, a, he's a motherfucker of a filmmaker. Let me tell you, he works his ass off and, and doesn't stop. He doesn't like, I, I remember like, um, it was very interesting to see him when he did the water boy. Uh, years ago at Disney, it was the last place that, um, 
that he that they pitched it to. And if they would have said no, that wouldn't movie would have been made. It was literally the last place was Disney to make it. I, uh, you know, by the way, I gotta I'm gonna I wanna be, tell you because I want to hear everything you're gonna tell tell me tell me about this. I want to say I worked with the executive at Disney who greenlit the Water Boy as an executive producer on something and was telling me about the Water Boy, and I was and I was like in my head I'm like this is a movie I saw in a movie theater. <laughs> like I, this was before I had, there was a concept of being like of, of ever meeting any of you guys. And I, and I'm like, so keep going. He was telling me something about the water boy. Keep going. Well, the first screening of it bombed because they didn't have the hits in it. You know, they didn't have the powerful hits. And yeah. also he was stuttering too much. Uh, so he literally, and this is the genius of Adam and like, um, he literally revoiced the entire movie his voice and cut all the stuff because it was too much. So he cut it back a little bit to where uh, he was doing uh, less. And then in the stuff that, you know, where he was really overdoing it, he cut it back and then he put in the hits and edit. And then the next screening was the one I was at. And it was with, um, the, the great actress, uh, from misery. Um, uh, come on. What's her name? Uh, Oh, Kathy B- mama, Kathy Bates. Yes. Yeah, sorry. And um, Kathy Bates was behind me, just hysterically cackling the whole time, like, ah! And, I, and then she told me after the movie, I mean, after the screening, she said, I got, the, I got the script, and I threw it in the garbage. And my niece, who worked for me, <laughs> put it, she said, what is that? She said, that's a script from, so who's it from? It's from Adam Sandler. And she said, no, 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 no. He's really funny, really funny. And she picked it up. And then she said, no, 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 you have to, you know, it's a comedy and it's a specific thing. You got to read it again. And so together they both read it and then they were really laughing. And that was the first comedy she had done. Um, Sandler's a fascinating dude. Like he's he's a a, genius. He's a real genius. He's a, I I had a, I had an interview go horrifically wrong with him, but he was very nice and generous. I don't know if, it was I didn't know the specifics of it, but I, I did know that you said something because I follow you. I, like, I, it was, we were doing a, a comedy gives back or some shit. It was on Zoom and I was with Whitney Cummings and Whitney's like, you know, you're a huge Adam Sandler fan. Like all you guys, you don't understand, all you guys define my personality. Like I'm watching all of you guys, there's parts of that, your whole crew, including like Chris Rock is the reason I got into stand up. Like Chris Rock, is I watched Bring the Pain, and I this is back when H, when you had to re- record something if you wanted to see it twice. <laughs> so I recorded it on my VCR, and then I stopped. I, I, I said, I'm not going to watch this right now. I went out and got a 12-pack of beer, came back and, st- and watched it and was crying laughing. Spade, Farley, yourself, um, Sandler, all you guys you. are so are, – are, were so integral. I mean, my, my, we watched um, Deuce Bigelow my family on vacation <laughs> and we watched it in the movie theater. And my dad does not, my dad's laughed at like a couple things. Like he's just not a big laugher, and, but when he does laugh, it's uncontrollable <laughs> and he can't stop okay. it. And Deuce big, the only two movies that have ever made my dad laugh are Deuce Bigelow. And there's something about Mary <laughs> he was crying in Deuce Bigelow, crying, laughing. It was, and oh, so like all you guys, I was wondering, so I have an opportunity to interview Adam and I say to him, um, when he's like, you're really excited. And the first question I ask him is I go, do you have Netflix? And, and there, <laughs> and, and by the way, I didn't even know this interview went poorly. I got, I go, I go, I watched, I watched your movie happy Madison with my kids the other day, which is a, it is like, it's obviously happy Gilmore, but if you're, you know, that his company's name is happy yeah, Madison. Yeah. So it's just, a sl- he gave me a pass line. I asked so many stupid fucking questions. <laughs> At one point I was like, can I tell you a story? The, the person running the interview, one of the people, executives, calls me up as I'm driving home and is like, that Adam Sandler interview, huh? And I was like, yeah, it went great. I, didn't, I was oblivious that I didn't, <laughs> that I fucked it up. And they're like, what do you mean it went great? You asked me guys, Netflix. I go, yeah, well, I mean, I was wondering. And he's like, he has a fucking $400 million deal at Netflix. He definitely has Netflix. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like, you called it Happy Madison? You told him a story about 
him. You told him a story about you watching one of his movies. Like you didn't let Adam Sandler talk. <laughs> but then he was very, he was very nice. I think Spade reached out and he was like, that interview was hilarious. And then Adam <laughs> tweeted that he watched my special and it was like, as long as he knew that I, I wasn't trying to be a dick, I was just fucking got nervous. Yeah, I had some people that were a dick to me recently. These bar stool guys who just had had didn't make me laugh once the whole interview and didn't say anything funny, and it was very disappointing because, like you know, I heard those were those were funny guys and they weren't with me. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Miller High Life. Miller High Life brings pride to the simple things in life. It is an unpretentious quality beer with refreshing champagne-like tiny bubbles in an iconic glass bottle accessible to all. I saw as I left the bubble as I, in Macon, Georgia to fly home, I saw one of my cameramen walk in with a, uh, a case of Miller High Life. And I said, hey, Miller High Life. And he said to me, I'm celebrating because we were done with our show. I thought it was cool that he said that because whether it's big or small, there are moments within every day we're celebrating and you can celebrate with Miller High Life, the champagne of beers, because it's a high quality beer within everyone's reach. Their founders believed in 1903 on New Year's. What a great time to start a project is New Year's Eve. Their founders believed that everyone should enjoy the good life, which is why they created the champagne of beers. They've been famously known as that for over a hundred years. Here's the deal. Miller High Life, the champagne of beers, a quality beer within everyone's reach. Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It has been a tough year in 2020. I don't go anywhere without my Whoop, and I'll tell you why. First thing I do when I wake up is I check my phone, check my Whoop app, and I see how I slept. I see if my recovery was in the green. If it wasn't in the green, I get mad. If it was in the high yellows, I get upset. If it was in the reds, I'm livid. We all want to live a healthier lifestyle. You need to know more about yourself and how that your behaviors impact you. That's why Whoop is the best fitness tracker I've ever used in my life. They provide personalized insights into your body's recovery, strain, and sleep with actionable feedback in real time. You know when your body's recovered or if it needs rest. You know how much stress your body can take. I use the strain coach every time I work out. You go to the strain coach, and it shows you on a, on a pie chart what area optimally where you should be, but where you can work out and know that you've really killed it that day. And sometimes, to be honest with you, you look at it, and you're like, that's how hard I got to work out today? I don't feel like that. Then you look, and you're like, oh, it turns out my body's asking for that. They give you real insights so that you can take things to the next level, find out if drinking caffeine or certain diets impact your sleep and recovery in a way that's Personalize your body. Pers optimize your behaviors. For anyone looking to build any smarter, healthier habits, Whoop is a no-brainer. For my listeners, Whoop is offering 15% off with the code BERT at checkout. Go to Whoop.com. That's W-H-O-O-P.com and enter BERT at checkout to save 15% off. Get to know yourself on a deeper level. Unlock yourself with Whoop. Getting back to something fun. There's uh, Chris Rock. He's the one who talked me into doing stand-up again. Because I was, you know, the thing that was um, was a trip was like, you know, he obviously was like a tremendous stand-up. When he's in control of, of that, I mean, I really think he changed modern comedy. And there are people who, who yeah. could say, uh, you know, Chappelle, or they could say, you know, I think, I think it really is the, the modern geniuses of it. Chappelle's absolutely brilliant. But the guy who changed it into, into what weird kind of, you know, the wave that we're still on was rock. And I remember yeah. seeing him in 96 because we were on SNL and like, truthfully, like he admits this, that he didn't hit hard on that show. And it was, um, you know, he it, didn't, he didn't. And as a watcher, a viewer of that show, it bummed me out because I was a Chris Rock fan back in the day when, when, because you heard that Eddie Murphy knighted him, that he was yeah. like, you're my guy. And so in, yeah. and it, when this is back before you knew, like everything was common knowledge. And I remember hearing that and going, okay, if Eddie Murphy thinks this guy's funny, then this guy's my guy. And when yeah. he got with you guys, I went, this is going to be fucking magic. I know, right. but the problem with that show is is the limitations of that show show your own limitations. And, and what, what it is is that show is about characters. If you can do yeah. characters, and Eddie did characters. I mean, and Eddie would come on and do uh, a different stuff, and that would and it hit really hard, you know, whether he's doing the little rascals guy 
or um, or what he would play, and and then he would knock it out, and his confidence was off the charts. Um, so Rock is always going to be Chris Rock, and and there's nothing wrong with that. And as far as you know, there's oh. two kinds of acting. You got the Al Pacino's who can play Scarface, and then he could play like a, a, you know a guy in a, a um, cruising in a gay. Those are different parts, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a gay serial killer movie. And you yeah. got Scarf a Cubano, which is a very risky thing for this for a guy to say, "I'm going to commit to doing this the whole fucking time and commit and did it." It was almost uh, it was almost like a 1930s character, but um, and then you have characters like our Humphrey Bogart, Humphrey Bogart in every in every movie. So there's that there, there's those two two things, and they're just as valid. And like Harrison Ford's always going to be Harrison Ford. You're not going to see Harrison Ford playing different roles. Um, you know, he's got to have a whip and a gun, and people go, oh, "Yeah, yeah, 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 I want." Yeah. <laughs> and then where Harrison Ford plays a guy with a brain injury, he'll go, I don't know. You know what I mean? He had that movie regarding Henry. People were like, where's the whip? Where's the gun? You know? Yeah. So the audience. Get, Han Solo had a gun and a Wookiee. It's, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. You're wanted, right. Where's Harrison the Ford's good movies were just Harrison <laughs> Ford playing his version of Harrison Ford in space. As yes. a, you know? Exactly. And so, so for Chris Rock is Chris Rock is as powerful as Chris Rock up there, you know? And, and so I went to go see him in 96. He was playing in San Diego. And I said, I just want to drive down and see you. And I drove down. And uh, it was a Sunday night, and it wasn't packed. It was pretty packed. But and his set was, was fantastic. Uh, but it wasn't like, uh, like lights out, like what he was going to be in six months. And he said to me, and he, and he said he was working out his stuff. This was a chunk of his stuff that he was working. And he said, dude, I'm about to, he didn't say dude, that's my word, but he said, I'm about to blow up. And I'm about to blow the fuck up. And I went, okay, yeah, all right. You know? And he said, I said, I got this special that I'm working on, man. I'm telling you, it's going to blow up. And he saw it. And I didn't see it completely that night. But then that special, that first one, at HBO, it was like, I saw, and it just, you know, it was brave. It was brilliant. It was absolutely the logic and the absurdity uh, of it was uh, the logical absurdity to his, uh, the progressions of, of his material was, was phenomenal. And, and it did, it really did change. The, and then, you know, I worked with him like years later, uh, 10 years ago on a movie uh, with Adam Sandler, Grown Ups, And he was just talking to me every morning. We get to talk and like, look, wait for Selma Hayek to come out of her dressing room and go, how could she be this beautiful at 7am? You know? Right. And then um, he said, you should go back and do stand up. And I said, man, I don't know. I said, by the time I had, you know, by the time him, me, Adam Sandler, David Spade had 25 minutes, we were on Saturday Night Live. We never really had a good hour, you know, at that that's time. That's fascinating because that's fascinating. It's so interesting because you guys all started as stand-ups. And I remember watching Adam, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this glowingly, but I remember watching Adam at the improv one night with a notepad trying to get back on stage. And you yeah. could see how far disconnected he was. Like you could see that like when he started stand up, he was very young and a character. And then some of the movies he had done, you could see he had outgrown that character. And, but, but he was only tethered to the presenting that material as that character. Like it was a really like uh, I'm trying to think of another example. It was like Bobcat. Remember when Bobcat yeah. had the voice and Adam, it was like almost watching Adam act 17. When he isn't 17, he was a grown man. <laughs> I will tell you this, though. The key to Adam is that id of his. That 14-year-old to 17-year-old yeah. id never left him completely. The one, yeah, so, the, the one so joke that regression had. isn't really a fake. It isn't really a, a plan. It's, the, it's his go-to safety zone. Because, and it's also, he really stayed in it longer than most human beings. And I, and I, I mean that. It's like He still has that excitement for material for jokes, literally when he has something funny or you say something, he will like jump out of the chair like, a, like he did at 14 and 15. And so he does have that and still, and still has not really lost that. But I, I think seeing him get back on stage and um, to me, the only crutch he had was, was like having to like, just in case I got my ax. But then when you get to see him, you know, his guitar. So, yeah. uh, and the people want that. Oh, but yeah, he, he loves being as just a straight stand up and about I would say about half the act is just him doing stand up now and then half of it is music. 
and music is, you know, it just carries through and he's become a really terrific musician and a songwriter and, and he's allowed himself to write emotional songs and, and also just the silliest stuff. And to me, like silly's King and Adam at his best, you know, uh, you know is, is the silly, you know, that's what I love about you guys. I, I say you guys, I want to get off Adam and cause I mean, and anyone can talk about your group, your, your group of friends as uh, honestly changing the uh, collective unconscious of, of America, of how boys were raised. And, and I, I always say, one thing I love about you guys is that you guys were joke first, like joke first, just the, the funny thing first. Everything was funny thing first. And e even in the essence of your movies, it was funny thing first. And I don't care if you don't think I'm, if you don't care if you think I'm political or if I'm uh, insightful or I read books about philosophy, I just want you to laugh. That's my thing. Thank you. When I tell you what, it's like that is the toughest thing to fight against is the uh, urge to say something. I mean, you have to be there to entertain, to entertain, to entertain. If you could do it and say something by accident, then fine. But, and I'm not putting down, you know, the, the, you know, the George Carlins of it all, but like, I do remember specifically uh, Jay Leno talking about uh, comedians when they get serious and it's called, he called it Lenny's disease. Yeah. Lenny Bruce disease of the great, the guy who really changed censorship for stand up comedians. And, and uh, I'm not, I think you can, there are, you know, I'm not taking away from like, like Chappelle is a, you know, s social satirist and, and, it, and is absolutely brilliant. He is basically like almost like a soothsaying, wisdom uh you know people it's almost like a religious leader when people go see Chappelle, they go see him like this yeah like please make sense of the world for me but to me the guys when we came out of that group um it was you know silly is king and silly will always be king it's like it was peter sellers pink panther it was monty python those guys were like you know it's it's all about however you can get the laugh, the surprise, or whatever. And you can still be, you know, br the, you know Peter Sell is brilliantly funny. And, and like, you know, Monty Python's the high watermark of comedy in the 20th century. I, I would defy anybody to try to prove me wrong on that. But the, um, the king of it was, and when I've, I've been lucky enough to, to spend time with John Cleese, he said, silly is king. It always will be. Silly is king. The siller you can, silly, the more silly you can be is better. And I remember when I started jumping back into stand-up, 10 years ago, it was um, Dom Herrera, who was, was a brilliant, uh, love Dom brilliant, and, and, and a wonderful comic who um, has, you know, if you see him, you'll never see him not be entertaining. And, it, and he just sne sneaks in the silly. And I remember he told me one night, he said, and he saw me perform, and it, it went good, but I think it went more good because I was famous than because I, I did great that night. And this is when I started getting back into it. And he said, Rob, let's go get some soup. And he took, we went to get some soup next door. This is at the Laugh Factory. We went next door to the, uh, to the Jewish deli there. And he said, you're funny when you're silly. Don't fight it. A lot of guys can stand up there and just talk. But they can't be silly like you can. And that's when you're funniest. And I went like, holy shit, he's right. What am I doing? And uh, yeah. so th that's what helps. Like when you're silly... I mean, that's, that's the thing people oh, love. I, I have no, I have no inclination, especially the way the world's working now. I have no inclination to try to give you my opinion about anything. Like I have no, I have no need to tell you who I'm going to vote for or why you should vote for someone else. Like I wrote, I wrote a great jump. I wrote, I wrote a great joke this morning. Neil Brennan, uh, had a tweet about, um, the people on uh, doing Trump parades in boats. Yeah. And by the way, those are just so that we are all clear and have our cards on the table. <laughs> those are all my friends I grew up with. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. Is, every fucking friend of mine in Tampa is, is in those Trump parades. Okay. And he yeah. called them, he, what did he call? He called them something, uh, yacht supremacists. And then I said, Oh, I call them Yahtzees. <laughs> and then, oh, yeah. And then, but, and then you go, well, I'm, that's never going to make it in my act. Cause I'm never, I, I, I don't, you know, as much as I don't give a fuck about politics, I really don't care one way or the other. I really don't. I don't want to try to like, I just want you to disconnect. And if I do have a joke, like I have a joke about uh, buying a gun 
if I do have a joke, I want to play both sides of the fence fairly so that both types of people in the room don't feel like they're getting picked on. They feel like they're getting picked on equally. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the goal. That's what I try to do. But you have a situation now where um, if you're even perceived as leaning one way, you're out and you're out forever. Yeah. I mean, like you're out and out forever. That's the thing about you have um, a a real, um, an intolerancy and, you know, and it's so funny because like I'm a classic seventies liberal. I mean, I grew up in San Francisco, all my teachers that I, that I worship, they were all gay. So like all my heroes in college are these, these wonderful gay people in theater. And they're like, and then everybody in the, and then, so it was like, uh, so I, the, the idea of gay rights being anything but like obvious, you know, and like women's rights, equal rights, civil rights. I mean, like, you know, my mom's Filipino. I mean, like, uh, I, I remember, you know, my dad was like the first guy in San Francisco to rent homes to uh, African-Americans in 1954. And he said, before the civil rights thing, he said, no, 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 this, this is wrong uh, to, to segregate. And he said, and he just made that decision. So that's the household that I grew up in. Now, but if you dare critique the left at all or, or liberalism or, or try to check some stuff that seems out of whack, then you get labeled as this, you know, right-wing supremacist or whatever, or racist, you know. I get called like the Daily Beast, which is like a just a, a shit um, a internet site. It says Rob Schneider's proof of racism, and it's like, uh, and, and I didn't even look it up, but like my friend said, like, well, no, it's just you dressed up as a Hawaiian guy. And I said, dude, that was for Sony. What are you talking about? I didn't write that. I mean, I, I had lived a lot of it, but like, it's like this is insane. I mean, like to me, the whole part of being an actor is to play somebody that you're not, and the farther yeah. away that you could be the better. When I saw like um, Peter Sellers playing, I mean, he was the first guy who nailed that East Indian accent for that movie, The Party. And I'm telling you, the movie as a whole just isn't memorable, but him playing that guy and going, birdie num num, birdie num num. Yes, my friend, yes, my friend. It was so ridiculously silly. I remember like watching that movie when I was a kid and I couldn't breathe. I remember being on my hands and knees crawling out of the movie theater because my stomach hurt so much. I literally was on my hands and knees walking on popcorn just to get out. I, I just had to breathe. I couldn't breathe in the theater. And I said, no, that's what I want to do for a living. I didn't know how to do it at that time. But I said, if I can do that, yeah, just make a movie where the, the audience is, it's just like, you know, when, it's like stand up. When you're, when you're getting them rolling, you slow, slow them down for a little bit until they can't breathe. And then you regroup and then get them again. It's a wave of it. And that, that's, what's the funnest thing. And if you, lucky enough to be able to get that in any way, whether it's a movie, a TV show, or, uh, you know, and stand up, which is amazing. So uh, like, but at the same time, I think I'm bringing up right now, at least my act, I don't know what it's going to turn into right now. I am talking about what people are going through, but for comedy, like, in other words, I talk about being in quarantine and what that's doing for comedy, but I don't really feel like I need to tell them or, uh, I, I would rather if I have a point of view, which I think people will realize if they come see me, I want to subvert them to my point of view and, and, and not use the um, cheerleading and, and the fake of, uh, of, of using comedy for imposing my ideology. You know, I, I call it through a comedic imposition, which I, I find that to be um, not entertaining. You know? Not entertaining. I, and I, I'll, I think both of us would agree that like, Whatever Chappelle did that last, the last thing he released that was 35 minutes was engaging. It wasn't absolutely hilarious, but it was engaging and that's who he is. And his last specials, while they do have a point, I, I would always argue are straight up hilarious. He makes me oh, laugh yeah. harder than anyone. No, the but last they, thing was a social yeah. commentary that was healing. It was that, healing. It was awesome. Was and it's like, I don't yeah. want to take that away. I'm just saying I'm not that guy. Yeah. Like, I mean, no, no, no. I mean, you're if, a you white. Do, if you can do it and, 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 you know, if you could do it and, and say something, but I think the most important thing is to know is to remember they're there to entertain. And, yeah. I, and if you could do both, it's great. I mean, I've, um, I mean, I, I don't even know. I, I don't think you should guide where you're going and you shouldn't, you know, it's like that structural side of your brain. It's like, you know, it's like when people ask, how do you write or whatever? It's like, well, you know, there's a great book on writing by Kenneth Atchity. It's called On Writing. And Kenneth Atchity discusses uh, some very interesting parts about creativity, which is the structural side, which is the left brain, which is left brain dominant with your brain. And the right side is creativity. That's why you get up in the morning, you have about 45 minutes of 
being silly and something and you're right and then it goes away. It's yeah. because the structural side wakes up a little bit later and goes, what the hell do you think you're doing? That, <laughs> stop it, you know? And then late at night, the structural side gets, gets, you know, and when you drink, the structural side gets a little, and you get goofy. So, and that's how it, it kind of works. But, um, you know, it, it's writing and the mystery of it. And that's what they call the, you know, uh, the, mis the, uh, the merciless mistress of innovation, creativity. Because you don't know what it's going to come. And the idea that you're going to guide it completely uh, is, uh, you know, it's like, where, did, where does your stuff come from? You know? Yeah. Uh, who fucking knows what what i'm curious i i feel like i know a lot about your adult life and i'm i want to talk to you about i want to talk to you about how that early time at happy madison when you guys were making deuce bigelow hot chick animal like those early times when you were making those movies and i don't even know if happy madison made all of them but like i want to talk about the creative of what the process was to be around someone like adam who could green light a movie for you and how you shared ideas or didn't because that was my biggest problem when I first moved to Hollywood is I'd meet someone who's a producer and yeah. I, meet, I remember being like how the fuck are you supposed to be around this person like do you not pitch movies all day long to them until they buy one and then you make it and then you're friends like well <laughs> you know what it's uh he started um he made two movies for Universal and he offered them first to uh, Lorne Michaels and Billy um, Madison and Happy Gilmore. Happy Gilmore, those first two ones, and then I don't. And I think because because Lorne had a deal at Paramount. This is just what I know. This is my probably third hand, and uh, for I don't know what Lorne was involved in at that time, but I just I, I don't know what he's restructuring the show or whatever. And I think it was just you know Adam had uh, just left SNL, and uh, so but Lorne didn't have the attention that he should have to jump on those. Lorne Michaels, a producer of SNL. Uh, so Universal got the deal. And those, um, those two movies did middling, which in other words, they made their money. It cost like, I think, maybe eight to eight million dollars or $10 million a movie, which is a low budget. means you're making it in Canada. At that time, yeah. Toronto or someplace. And it made like 35 million, which was good enough, but not like a home run, like not like a, enough to like to green light your, your own movies or to get anything you want to make, which turned it, which he turned into. So the, that what happened was they offered Adam this, um, uh, Casey Silverman, which was the head of universal at the time, uh, offered Adam this movie to be in a movie with a chimpanzee. And, uh, I was like, what, is this what you think of me? I'm going to do this. Movie <laughs> with this? Like a chimp? Is this what you, you know, because his movies are very, very funny, and they're also very intricately done. Even the early ones are very silly and fun. You could watch them. And the key to Adam, and I remember watching, like, I, I remember what the real key to him was on SNL. Because we were buddies before SNL. But on SNL, he did this thing during the Iraq War called Iraqi Pete, which was basically, you know, Baghdad Bob or whatever the guy who's promoting. is like, everything's fine. We're winning. We're killing the enemy. And, then, you know, he's in a bunker. We're killing him. And he did, the, he did Iraqi Pete. The first time we saw it live, we laughed. The second time, we laughed hard. The third time, we were dying. The fourth time, we watched the same thing. The fourth time we watched him, we were crying laughing because he's doing all these little crazy things and the way he's saying things and the commitment. And it was just, uh, it just there's a lot going on with him that you just don't catch right away. That's why his movies are watchable and watchable and more watchable as they go, because they really are intricate. And that's why comedies never win the Academy Awards, because people just dismiss them as easy, it's simple. But it's way more complicated, and it's really way more thought out. And, um, you know, when it's done well. So um, after that, he felt, felt like, no, that's not what I, you know, I'm not going to do a movie with a chimpanzee. You know, he, he's a... So, um, some other comedian did it, some other comedy actor. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> you know, everyone listening to this podcast is scouring chimpanzee movie going at universal. Up. You can look it up. You'll find it. Uh, but, uh, and for my, for somebody else, it might be a fun movie. I don't know. Maybe like I've been dying to work with a chimp. You know what I mean? My whole career. I'm sure. We've, so, uh, and, so he left and then did, um, uh, the wedding singer, which was at, uh, at new line. And that, that, and I remember seeing that jump in his filmmaking skills between that and then 
uh, The Wedding Singer, which was a really solid movie. And then that movie did like 80 million. And I was like, and I saw that and went like, he really was able to kind of take all his experiences from those first two movies and then put it into that Wedding Singer, which was like, I said, well, that's a, that's a, a movie that holds up with, with any other comedy that's, that's been made in 10 years. And I said, this is really, or 20 years. I said, this is something that like, you know, um, you know, Warren Beatty in his, you know, shampoo kind of days, you know, that kind of, that kind of era. Uh, so, um, and then, um, he did, um, you know, the water boy. And I remember he called me up and I had just seen Chris Rock performing. So this is all kind of happening at the same time. I just saw Chris yeah. Rock in San Diego. So wait, tell me where you are in your life at this time. Okay. So Mia, I'm in, um, I've just did this TV series, Men Behaving Badly. Which oh, is like, oh, shit. With, uh, you were with, um, don't tell me, don't tell me. Um, I want to put my balls in it. Oh, yeah. Ron Eldard was, um, uh, Ron Eldard was the first season. And then the next season was the guy from the state. Yes, the guy from the state. Yeah, yeah. He, he's very funny. Yeah. Um, oh, fucking, I forgot you did Men Behaving Badly. He was very young. That, I forget his name now. The, the San Marino. Season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he I forgot was, you did men behaving badly. Yeah, he was very, very young, and and um, and, and unfortunately, like that, we didn't really hit it off the two of us, and you could tell the chemistry. And I think it was also just the nerves of of doing a, a and it was his first big thing, and and he was a, he is a very sweet guy, and just um, uh, and was obviously talented. Ron Eldard. Ron Elder was the first season. The problem with that show was. <clears throat> the only reason, because I didn't want to do TV, I just wanted to make movies. I was coming off of doing a string of movies. And so NBC called me, and it was like Warren Littlefield, the guy who chose um, to, when he, to get rid of uh, Johnny Carson <clears throat> and not pick David Letterman. That was Warren Littlefield. He calls me up at my house and up in San Francisco. And um, i just done a movie, a couple of movies in Europe, Judge Dredd and doing uh, one in Czechoslovakia. He calls me up and say, listen, forget about all the shit you've been in. How come I can't find, I remember I watched men behaving badly. It was only two, two seasons. It, it was tough. Honestly, it was tough. I said, I, I, and so I got it. It was from, um, Carsey Werner uh, who did the, the Roseanne shows, which was the biggest show, blah, blah, blah. And they all became super rich off that show. Literally it made that company. And, um, they, um, I think they made two crucial errors. I said, I'll do it. If you, because I saw the show Men Behaving Badly in England, and I said, if you, if you just do redo the shows as they're written, I'm in. And he said, no, we got the same executive producer. He's going to be blah blah blah. And then sure enough, they fucking ruined it. They yeah. came in and they switched it out, and they got a guy. They said, because I said I want to be one of the writers. They would never let me in the writers' room. It was a fucking mess. <clears throat> but but be that as it may, there was no way when it became a performance night. I'm going to. I'm going to knock it out and do the best job I can. So I performed um, and would do the, you know, and I, I would still kill it. And then they would use that against you. Like, what were you complaining about the material? It killed. And I'm like, yeah, I made it kill from all the <laughs> insanity in my mind. You know, God, I watched men behaving badly. I was, was it on Sunday nights on Fox. Uh, I think, no, no, no. It was uh, NBC and I think it was on. originally Wednesdays. And then I think we did go to Thursdays and, it was I, 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 watched, kind of I watched men fucking behaving badly. <laughs> I remember when Cam Marino got added. And now I'm looking at Ron Eldard going, Jesus, man, he's been in everything. He's a terrific actor. Yeah. It's, you know, again, you got to commit yourself to the silliness. And he did. And for, uh, you know, for to me, the, the blessing and curse of a dramatic actor is if you can uh, approach comedy and commit to it. Like, I remember because I worked with John Landis years ago, who did you know, Animal House, which is like the most, the, the really what changed comedy. And, yeah. I, and it's still like, you know, the, if you go back and go underneath all the comedies and, you know, something about Mary or whatever, you go keep digging, keep digging. You're going to go, oh, it's Animal House right there. You know, that's John Landis. Yeah. And he loved to have dramatic actors who play things straight, who understood the comedy and didn't play it for the comedy. The problem is when you get a dramatic actor out there, Bert, who's like, who, who, uh, Oh, I get to have fun now. And then you start to see that, you know, <laughs> whenever I'm doing a scene with a dramatic actor in a comedy and I see the, the, the corner and they go, ah, oh, we're in trouble. We're in trouble now because he thinks it's funny. He wants to have fun. And that's, you know, it's like, uh, like my buddy Harvey, Harvey Keitel, great actor. He was terrific. And we just did the 
well, five years ago, we did the Ridiculous Six with Adam. And I loved Harvey. But Harvey, when he was on Saturday Night Live, he couldn't get through a sketch with us. It was a sketch, me and him together. We were playing this uh, Indian casino bit together. And it was really funny and fun. But he started laughing in the middle of the sketch. And I just had to cover for him. And, and then he started dying at me covering for him. And the sketch got cut. But it was like hilariously fun to just, the, the audience was screaming, laughing. But I'm saying, so, so the dramatic um, guys have to really um, not take it too far to be funny in the same way that they could do with the drama. And a drama, in some weird way, you know, you can take things out further and bigger in a drama without looking ridiculous. If you do it in a comedy, it could be ridiculous. This podcast is brought to you by Mint Mobile. Breaking up with your old wireless provider just got a whole lot easier thanks to Mint Mobile. They're the first company to sell premium wireless service online only. And now Mint Mobile is introducing their unlimited data plan for just 30 bucks a month. Let that sink in. An unlimited data plan for $30 a month. How much sooner is your soon-to-be X wireless company charging you right now? Think about what they're charging you right now. For people that hate their phone bill and are ready to cut ties with big wireless, Mint Mobile offers their premium unlimited plan for just 30 bucks a month. Go online only and eliminate and the traditional cost of retail. Mint Mobile passes significant savings that they're getting on to you. All plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Here's your own phone with any of the Mint Mobile plans and keep all your same numbers, all your existing contacts. If you're not 100% satisfied, Mint Mobile has you covered with their seven-day back money guarantee. Break up with Big Wireless and switch to Mint Mobile Premium Unlimited Data for just 30 bucks a month. To get your new unlimited wireless plan for just 30 bucks a month and get that plan shipped to you, at your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash BurtCast. That's mintmobile.com slash BurtCast. Cut your unlimited wireless bill to just 30 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash BurtCast. This podcast is brought to you by my best friend, Theragun. My best friend, Theragun, is now being shipped to me from Macon, Georgia, home. I almost carried it on the plane with me, but with the name gun, I was a little afraid to. This thing is invaluable. I have pain in my, uh, it's for my sciatic nerves, but it's in my hamstrings and my butt cheeks. It becomes sitting right here, sitting like this. And I know a lot of us are sitting right now becomes extremely painful, painful for me. And it's from all the running and now tennis that I'm doing. And I am in pain by myself because my Theragun's being shipped to me. If muscle pain's a real thing, and if you're running through it, that's the Theragun is the only thing that I know that helps. It's a handheld progressive therapy device that releases your deepest muscle tension using scientifically calibrated combination of depth, speed, speed, and power. And now it's quieter than an electric toothbrush practically. It is so great. You can move the thing so that you can use it on your back yourself. You can move the little arm so that you can use it on your leg. The all-new Theragun 4, Generation 4, has a proprietary brushless motor that's so quiet you'll wonder if it's on. And while you soothe your aching muscles, their signature power and amplitude and effectiveness, you're going to love it. Try Theragun risk-free for 30 days. There is no substitute for the Theragun Generation 4 with the OLED screen, the personalized Theragun app, and the quiet and power you need. Starting at only $199, go to theragun.com slash BurtCast right now to get your Theragun Generation 4 today. That's theragun.com. Slash Birdcast, Theragun.com, slash Birdcast, Birdcast. Get it? It's actually quieter than that. Birdcast. So you, so Adam's doing the first, the uh, wedding singer. You're yeah. at Men Behaving Badly. And you just then, talked to Chris Rock. I talked to Chris Rock, and then um, he uh, is doing this movie. He calls me, he said, I'm in Florida come out and do this uh, one line. Water and he said, I said, what is it? And he says, is it, it's, uh, you can do it. And I go, uh, what is it? And he said, just get out here and we'll figure it out. Just be fun. We'll have dinner. That was his, that was his, <laughs> that was his pitch. We'll have dinner. And, I, and I, I'm always up for a dinner. Yeah. And he said, come on, we'll, I'll, I'll explain it when you get out here. You just do it in different ways. And so sure enough, it basically, it was like a character that I did on, on Saturday Night Live, uh, you know, Steve-O, Steve Arino. And it was a way to like kind of do that and make a silly way of, of redoing things. 
and showing up so they can go, oh, there's, you know, there's that guy, you know, and I want like, you got to be really careful when they're, oh, there's that guy, because that's very close to, oh, no, there's that guy again. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't want to see that guy. I just saw that guy. Ah! So, so uh, but I trusted him. We went out, and the thing that struck me about that movie was, like, The Water Boy, was how, what a good golfer he was. He's a super competitive person. I remember, I remember I was Saturday Night Live, and I used to play tennis in high school. I said, I'll bet you $500 right now uh, I can beat you in tennis. It's in a set, uh, six. We left. Got a place to open up at midnight to one in the morning, and he beat me. That's how crazy competitive he is. I mean, like, we got the place to open up in Manhattan at midnight. So that, he's a nut that way. So, um, uh, so, he, he, so we're out on the golf course, and I hadn't played in a while. And I see him in the sand trap, and it's a nice golf You know, like, we were in Orlando. They got great golf courses there. Yeah. And it's like a drier grass, so the ball runs really well there. And um, so I see him chip it out 30 feet, 35 feet. From, the, from a deep sand bunker into the hole. And I went like, oh, my God. And then I saw him hit another 40-footer. And I went like, this, this guy's – and then – so I said, if he's on in golf, and he's really on in his game on, on this movie, and he really was. He was absolutely on target for this and then made the quick changes to it after the movie had come out. The script was fantastic. It was silly and screamingly funny. And whenever they had like a, a serious – moment to express a story like um uh it was a um like okay when when the coach is talking to because he really wanted gene wilder to play the coach you know like i mean i I think because that we're all heroes and and then like that was one of the the ideas you know and then uh, gene wilder wanted to play the whole thing in, in drag the whole time and uh and so he said well you know that you know we kind of have it thought out to do this and so it didn't work out um, but then like we ended up, he ended up meeting, uh, you know, Henry Winkler, which is like, Henry's brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. He really is really great. In that. He really is really great. He in that. just had the, just the perfect time. The guys who do sitcoms, uh, they, they really, they have to make really quick changes and boom, boom, and know how to work in front of a live audience. And he was just he had miraculously small and big when he needed to be. He was perfect in that. So, um, uh, so anyway, and the movie just, I did it in the different ways and then it got a big laughs and then they reshot it and had me add at the end, do it all night long. And I remember like, and then that movie, we were doing another movie for Sony. Um, his first picture for Sony was Big Daddy. And we're in, I mean, literally, I, uh, Adam at that time did not have the um, power to hire anybody, like to hire anybody he wanted, I should say. and so. He wanted me to play this one guy that, um, you know, the father of the real kid in Big Daddy. And uh, the studio said, no. And, and I said, don't worry about it. Don't worry. He said, no, no, we'll find something else. I said, don't worry about it. Just, you know, you're, I'm fine, you know. And he said, no, 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 we'll find something else. And, uh, and because the studio wanted Jon Stewart to play that role. At that time, yeah. Jon Stewart was hot and everything. And It's kind of crazy, too. It's a weird casting because Jon Stewart's so, so, so lovable right now. And yeah, I remember yeah. not liking him in that movie. <laughs> yeah, it was good casting. He was a little stiff in that, and I can just tell him he was perfect, yeah. like uh, like that guy. So, um, and then uh, he called me and said, "Listen, this other role with this guy who comes by, and it's um, the social worker." And then, and I said, "All right." And he says, "You know what? Truthfully, that's not a guy. I got a guy better than that for that." And he get and it was Josh Mostel, who's a great guy, Zero Mostel's son. It was in the other great stories I got to hear. Zero Mostel. All these names. Josh Mostel. Yeah. Zero Mostel was a guy who was like um, a knight at the forum, you know, back at, you know. Oh, I know Josh. That's Josh Mostel? Yeah. Well, Zero Mostel is his dad. Zero Mostel was like, you know, Tevia in uh, Fiddler on the Roof and, and like, uh, uh, and, and on. So, I mean, he did like, and he was, um, Oh, wow. Uh, he played him. I don't know if it was him in the movie, but like, uh, and then he was also in the producers, Zero Mostel. He was, was the, like, in the producers. The original producers. This guy's I mean, a crazy, a crazy genius in, in that, and a performer who just committed to him and Gene Wilder were like, you know, that's maybe the greatest two, twosome ever. Um, so anyway, then he calls me up and said, listen, there's like, it's, it's one line and it's, uh, it's the delivery guy. And I said, it says Chinese here. He said, ah, we just, you know, 
I said, well, how do you want me to play it? He said, you'll figure it out. He said, it's just one line. Don't worry about it. He said, no, we'll make something of it. We'll make more of it. So he literally, they fly me out on one line. Okay. I'm supposed to do one line, one day. That's it. And Adam would call me up and say, listen, just, um, they're going to keep you here for another week. I told him to keep you here for another week. Just come in (laughs) tomorrow and we'll figure out something. Yeah. I said, there's no, there's nothing in it. So the next thing I would be there very uncomfortably being in there. And it, I was not on the script, but I'm like that dressed as that character. And the next thing you know, I'm sitting next to like the kid and him. And like, that wasn't in the script really. And so <laughs> and then the next day I'm supposed to leave. He says, no, 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 stay. No, no, no. We'll come up with some, come on over. So we go sit in the sauna and then he would come up with some jokes for the next day. He would come up with jokes for me in the scene. Yeah. And then I would come up with something like when the, when the, when the, the social worker knocked on the door, there was nothing. So he said, just, you know, go up. And, and then, so I go up and they said, like, um, say something. And I went, do you always, I know you, you always order three pieces of cheesecake. <laughs> you know? And that was like, you know, one of the ad libs. So it was just, his strength was to like have a really good script and then make it better as you go. Keep making it better, keep making it better and edit out what ain't, what ain't uh, the best. And then uh, just keep what's the best. And, and then I was with him in his apartment uh, and in his like uh, hotel room, which is also when I realized he was a star because I just thought he's my buddy, Adam Sandler. But like, I remembered like, you know, when you have a hotel and there's like a balcony, well, this, yeah. this whole, this had a balcony that just went forever. It was like a balcony. You could have played football on it. We're like, Holy shit. This is like his room. And then there's another room and then there's a kitchen. And we're like, man, this, I didn't even know that they had those kind of rooms in hotels. I didn't know it that until that time. So, um, uh, uh, and then I was with him with that night in October of, um, gotta be like 97, 98. Yeah. Nine, 97 or 98 when the water boy came out and it was the first movie that ever made $39 million in October. No one had ever done that. That's like, you only bring movies out in the summer and the only movies that make money, like a ton of money in the opening weekends, the summer and Christmas. That was it. So this is, he was the first guy to go. Wow, you can have a big weekend if you have a big star and everybody want, is excited to go see. And that was the key to him was like, because those movies that I said did middling, like at Universal, 35 million for, for, the, uh, uh, for Billy Madison and for um, ha- Happy Gilmore. But in video, it was over 100. Oh, yeah, the video, that's, that's a different world back then. Yeah. Is that what the box office made was one thing. And then, uh, and then, when a video came out, that was a game changer. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause it was, I mean, all of a sudden it was the parachute for every movie, for every movie company. It was their parachute. That was their way to save them from crashing because it, it would, it would soften any blow. If their movie didn't hit in the theater, well, man, it's going to make money on video. We'll be fine. You know? And so, but he was not just big, he was gigantic. He was the biggest guy in video. And so it made sense for the studios jump in and uh so then how did you guys here's my question though how did you guys get from it's interesting i see your career i see yours and his career very very differently like when i saw happy gilmore i was in the movie theater we'd all watch billy madison in our fraternity house i was in the movie theater and we were crying laughing and we're like this is our new guy right so this is our guy (laughs) like he's one of us he's like i remember we took turns running out to the car and taking bong hits and running back in and actually <laughs> the theater. Yeah. And so like, so then, and then I remember I, it's funny. I do remember the wedding singer and water boy and, uh, big daddy. I remember big daddy being like the, Oh, this guy's like a movie star now. I remember that <laughs> feeling like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, but, but I'm curious, how do you go in a friendship to it where he's like putting you in things? And I, you're in, you're in already in all these movies. You're already in sitcoms. You're already working. You're already probably a millionaire at the time. And then how do you, like, how do you negotiate your friendship to then make Deuce Bigelow? Well, it was very interesting because uh, he suggested to, for me to write a movie, you know, cause I was talking to him about like, uh, cause everybody just thinks like, like, they don't realize that Adam really does everything. I mean, he works with really, really talented people like Robert Smigel who work with, um, with, um, and, um, his, his main writer from, 
I'm, I'm blanking on his Swartzen. name right now. No, the um, Swartzen also writes with him, but the uh, the guy from uh, the Irishman, the great Irishman. I'm kind of thinking, I'm blanking his name right now. I'm sorry. I'm have I have two young kids. I'm not getting any sleep. Um, what is his name now? Um, he's who's written a bunch of movies with him, probably more with him than anybody. Um, they great stories together from college. They were together. It's not covert, uh, is it? No, 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 don't co- not covert. Um, come on, I, 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 he's got like six kids, five kids. Irish, or Irish as the day is long. Um, God, I can't blank it on his name. God forgive me. Um, but anyway, so, um, so he he was writing. He said, "Just write your write your movie, and if it's if it's good, we'll 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 produce it." And I said, "I don't know what to write about." He said, "Just figure it out. Find what I'd figure out." Find something funny to write about. So I literally went up to my place in San Francisco, which is right above Chinatown, and um, went down at this place called Sam Woe's, but I was hanging out when I was in high school uh, because, you know, that was the only place that they would let you drink beer if you were, uh, if you were underage. So if you were 16, 17, you go to this place, they call it brown tea. They just give it to you. And, um, <laughs> and they, they would serve you Heineken, too, if it was Saturday night because they just hurt, they were in a hurry. No one's bothering Chinatown. And I honestly, this may sound like crazy racist, but like <laughs> to an older Chinese people, we, we look the same to them. Let's, let's be honest. Let's be honest. <laughs> All white dudes look the same to older Chinese gentlemen. So they would just serve us beer. So I went down there and I got some Chinese food. I walk it up three blocks to my house on Washington Street there. And I started watching. I said, well, I, I, said I got to write a movie. And I said, well, I don't know what to write about, whatever. I started flipping the channels and I just see, uh, I, I stop. Uh, Lauren Hutton is this very beautiful woman from the seventies. Yep. That'll stop you. If you're, if you're a heterosexual male who, who was like 13 in the seventies and you see Lauren Hutton, you're going to stop. You go, what is yeah. this? And, uh, it was, it was that Richard Gere movie. And I remember watching it and I go, what is this? he's getting? What is this beautiful, beautiful women? What are they? They can get any guy that they want. And so I said, who are the real women that would need, you know, a, a gigolo? And that was all. And I just, I went in the other room and I, I wrote that down. And then I started writing down some, fun. and then I started, and then I started writing, and then I started laughing, and then, um, you know, I, I, I wrote this uh, with Harris Goldberg, who was, uh, who was because I, I have awful attention deficit disorder, and I, I don't like to call it a name, but it's definitely an issue. And uh, he would literally grab me, put me at a Starbucks facing the bathroom. So to get me to write and to uh, write. And so we, I finally was able to write the stuff down. And, we, and then I got into a role with it where the, the stuff we were dying laughing. And then Harris came up with the, the girl, what if she's so tall we never see her head? And I went yeah. like, okay. I said, that's great. And I said, oh my, can we, I said, I, I said, forgot about that. And he said, he said, do you think we can do that? And I go, I don't know. And so <laughs> let's just write it down. And so then um, um, we, uh, uh, we wrote the first, it was 84 pages. And then Adam said, hey, I'm going to Hawaii. <laughs> Pack a bag, which is a great phone call to get. And, um, and I had the 84 pages. At that time, you know, I didn't have a computer. It was literally like, you know, um, I printed it out and like had like the pages. And he said, and I was looking at it, you know, and he said, what is that? So I was, uh, my script, he said. So, so you have the script. He said, you go write something out. You have the script. You've been working on it. And yeah. it's very natural that he's like, what are you looking at? And you're like, oh, it's a script I'm working on. It's just, that's the script. I said, he said, give me that. <laughs> give me that. Like that, you know, very violently. <laughs> he has this kind of faux violence, you know, give me that, you know. Yeah. So he's sitting on the plane, you know, at his plane. And uh, that, that, that he had, you know, I don't know what deal he got to get over there. And he's reading it. And I saw him just giggling and giggling and laughing and just stopping and just you know and doing this and i, I like and, and you know you know when you have somebody like what are you laughing at what are you laughing at you know yeah yeah, yeah i'm yeah. trying to fight that urge because i wanted to get through it and uh and he says i never get scripts like this why does he, he said to me why doesn't anybody write scripts like this for me and uh and, and so i said well do you like it? he said yeah yeah finish it we'll make it you know i said you know you got to finish it and I went, yeah, yeah, no, 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 I'm, I'm going to finish it. I'm going to finish it. No, no, and I, you know, it's like 84 pages. <laughs> You're like, and wait, so, why can't we just start making it? We'll finish it when we get there. <laughs> <laughs> and so my head is spinning about like, oh God, and I can't think about it. So I said, you know what? I, I, I can't be, I, I can't just take some time off and, 
and go on a vacation right now. So I went back to my room and I said, I'm leaving. I'm going to go back and finish the script. I'm going to do it. I'm going to get out of there. And I said, all right, I'm going to do it. So I told, you know, I, I told his agent, Adam Bennett, I said, Hey, I'm going to go back and write. I got to finish. I mean, I got to finish this. He wants, yeah, I, he liked it. So he really liked it. So I'm going to do this. So yeah. I, I said, I'm going to go back. So I go and pack my stuff. And I said, it's one of the nice rooms. He, he got me a beautiful room. And, um, and I said, well, I'm just going <laughs> to take a dump. I got to take a dump and then I'm going to go right to the thing. I said, let me just go to the bathroom. And so I literally am on the toilet. I swear to God, it's a true story. I swear to God. I'm sitting on the toilet and all of a sudden, Adam, I'm, I'm in, this is one of those, it's an open room. The whole room's open and everything. And it's like, it's not a separate room. He literally opens the door, <laughs> walks in with his agent and says, Hey, what are you doing? He said, I said, I'm, I'm, uh, I said, I'm, I'm just uh, thinking, you're not leaving. You're staying. You're not leaving. I know, no, I'm going to finish that strip. No, stay here. You're staying. He said, stay here. We'll make it. Just stay here. Have fun for with us. And then we go home and, and we'll make it. If you stay here, we'll make it. All right. <laughs> and I said, did my life just change taking a dump here? And <laughs> why? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it did. It absolutely did. And then um, that was the first movie he produced that wasn't his. That is, and it, it moves uh, like, if I remember this correctly, and I don't know exact numbers, but that was a big fucking movie. That did really good. That movie did more money in the, in the, in the, you know, in the secondary thing, in other words, the DVD, that's when DVDs first started. Oh, yeah. So in, in 2000, that movie made in the year 2000 m more money than Mission Impossible. God dang it. Yeah, it only made a, a one, it was like a million dollars less than the Green Mile. So it was that year in, in like DVD, v video, and all the, it was the uh, Green Mile, Deuce Bigelow, Mission Impossible. Oh, and the power that I gave, gave you. But like literally, I could at that point. It was just you know you could do anything you want, and it was like because there's that much money, they realize you know, and, and that's when I realized it's trying to make movies uh, before and after, and now was realizing the difference in like you know when you and I make something or want to do something or you do uh, you know your next hour or you're trying to make a movie, you're just trying to do um, what you really think is funniest, right? And what but and but that's not how the executives work. And I realized what it was. I'm like, oh, they don't work on something making it the funniest or, or what they think, what they'd like to see. They work on trying to delay their inevitable firing the longest because it's a good <laughs> gig. And like they know they're going to get fired and they know they're going to get fired soon. Chances are because everybody else is getting fired. Yeah. So what, what, and the only way that they could keep that going is to tie themselves to a boat that if that sinks, it's got to be such a big boat, it takes the whole studio down. And so it's like, that, so they put their name on a $200 million movie because they know the studio will get behind that because if that doesn't work, then, the, then the, the, you know, the president of the studio gets fired. And that does happen. That happens a lot too. This podcast is brought to you by Fight Camp. Are you like me and you get bored with your workouts? If you're looking for a workout that keeps you engaged and doesn't feel like you are sitting there losing your mind, if you want to learn, be excited, be motivated, a workout that's not going to get boring and is always challenging to you, then you need to check out Fight Camp. Fight Camp brings the boxing gym to your living room. They provide all the gear and top trainers, everything you need to get in a great workout. The boxing workout has always been ranked as one of the best ways to get in shape. My dad told me that when I was a kid. I remember we were talking about boxing. He goes, buddy, you couldn't last half a round boxing. I was like, dad, I play baseball. And he goes, apples and oranges, brother, apples and oranges, and was crying laughing. It's honestly one of the funnest ways I know to combine cardio and strength training. Fight Camp brings the boxing gym to you with a mix of cardio and conditioning for a full body workout. It comes with all the gear you need. The best freestanding punching bag on the market, great boxing gloves, quick wraps, their unique, unique punching track sensor shows you in real time progress and stats on any iOS device. Great for kids. The Fight Camp even has kid gloves. Well, not kid gloves, that's funny. Kid gloves, because it's meant to enjoy, be enjoyed by the whole family. It's the one and only workout that kids can get involved in, unlike weight machines and other at-home cycling treadmills, because quite honestly, not all of them are safe, in my opinion. Watch yourself re reach new milestones 
learn from six highly qualified trainers. And if you're new to boxing, their 12-week starter program teaches you the fundamentals of boxing while getting you a great workout every time. So you don't have to do it in a gym in front of a bunch of dudes that know what they're doing. And then you feel like a fool because you're the only guy that doesn't know how to throw a hook. And you will get hooked. Fight camp keeps you engaged, focused, and in the zone. Endless varieties, uplifting beats, motivated trainers, motivating trainers. Powerful technology combines, creates unique, satisfying workouts. Hey, and if you're worried about it, you can try Fight Camp for free. Just download the Fight Camp app, select the workout of your choice. That's a great way to test your trainer. And buy now, pay later. Using the A Firm financing, you can get your gym right away. Make easy monthly payments, and the gym is yours. Keep it at the end of the term. If you're approved for financing, you pay less than $100 a month, which is a cheaper than um, it's cheaper than almost any boxing gym you're going to find. Plus, you save on the commute and the time and the gas. That's money right there. And since you can have up to five accounts per household, you can get a full boxing gym for the whole family for just under $20 per month. Fight Camp offers flexible financing as low as 0% APR. And right now, as a limited time offer, you can try Fight Camp for just 30 days with their money back guarantee. All you got to do is go to fightcamp.com slash Bert. That is right. Try Fight Camp for 30 days. And if you don't love it, they'll refund your money. Train like a fighter and turn your sweat into muscle. To try Fight Camp for 30 days, just go to joinfightcamp.com slash Bert. That is joinfightcamp.com slash Bert. It's funny because we, um, it's, I've always been very anti-executive, meaning I everything I ever did that was tethered to executives was never had never worked my entire career. Everything, not one thing had ever been good. <laughs> like to the point yeah. where I was like, I was like, I maybe I'm not talented. Like I got I got <laughs> to like I think four, 42 years old, forty three years old, and I was like, I remember thinking maybe I'm maybe I'm not talented. Maybe it's there's something that like something that happens in the room when I do stand up that it's good. But it's not like I've never been on the uh, I've never made the like 10 hot young comics to watch. I've never been an industry darling, but I was yeah. working and I was getting laughs and I always had a good sense of humor. Like I what I found funny was always good. And so I was like, shit. It's about and then taste. I, yeah, it really then, is about taste. And then I and then I started doing my own career where I, I stepped away from television entirely. I stepped away from everyone entirely and just did stand up and did Instagram videos and stupid ideas I thought were funny, I would do like, uh, like fucking me and Tom Segura did a weight loss challenge. And I remember I was in a deal at NBC at the time and they were like, you need to focus on your sitcom. And I, and I remember being like, I remember they called my wife and they're like, Hey, you need to get Bert to like focus on the sitcom. This is a big deal. And she's like, Oh, you don't understand Bert. Like he is obsessed with this <laughs> weight loss challenge and making these videos and taunting his buddy and the rock just reached out and, and commented on it. Like that's where his focus is. Yeah. And I shifted everything away from anyone that would give me notes. And now I'm in a place where I'm like, I could sure use an executive every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's tough, but I will say that it's been absolutely liberating doing stand up again. It's basically all I've done the last 10 years, more or less is just stand up. And do you, do it, you have a, do you have an interest in, do you have an interest in, because I watched your special and it was fucking awesome. But it was, I oh, mean, thank you. I, but the thing that sucks the most is, and I, I hope you take this as a compliment. You, myself, any, everyone is going to be overshadowed when your daughter starts singing. That is fucking, oh, yeah. when oh, she sings you. at the end, her voice is so fucking different than anything you've ever heard and so magical, so overwhelming that you hear her and you're like, <laughs> Oh, I could have watched one hour of her singing. Like <laughs> I know, I, I I loved it, and I I called her because I didn't know what we were gonna do. And she's such a sweetheart, my my daughter Elle. That she's uh, she picked a song, and she the only reason she picked that song is she knew that I knew it. Yeah, and and well, you um, can sing too. I'm well, sitting there going, "What the fuck?" Well, I, I I said, you know, I, I don't know if this is gonna ever happen again. If uh, what I said, just come out. I'm gonna film this special. Just come on out and let's figure. it. We'll do a song together. And so she put the song together, and then. Um, I, um, you know, I, I just said, we'll see what happens. It was very magical. And it was also nice to, to acknowledge to the, you know, it's, it's tough having a famous dad. 
So for her to climb out from underneath that and, uh, and have her own career, I, I'm really ha- happy and proud of her. It and, really uh, is. It really has to be tough to have a dad that is, especially like, and I, I say this because I think I'm in the same boat, is a dad that is a silly, goofy, uh, hey, I'll, I'll be the guy in the Speedo, I'll be the guy in the thong, and yeah. on the big screen. That's me. That's been my whole career is, like, I have a Netflix series coming out. We have an, It gets announced, I think, Thursday. or maybe Oh, congrats, Thursday. man. That's a but, great uh, place. Yeah, well, yeah, but I'm fucking totally naked in it. Like, I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's everything that I find funny yeah. that you do in the moment that you're with your friends and you're all laughing hysterically and then you're laying in your bed going, God damn it, man, am I fucking naked? Like, <laughs> I don't know. My sister called me one time and she said like, will you warn me next time yeah. before you do it? I mean, it's like, I work with people and I'm like, I didn't, I know. And then my daughter, she, I've, she told me she didn't go to school one day because she wanted to see how the reaction would be after the movie came out. Really? And I was like, wow. So that's like, so it's, it's, it's not, it, it's not normal. Uh, but I, I, this was, you know, just 20 years ago, which is I think different. In a way, slightly, I, I didn't think it was, but now looking back, now it's innocent 20 years ago. Now with social media and everything and the instant impact and the instant contact that celebrities offer and give to their fans, it's unbelievable. And so that's really what it is. So I, when I did my, because I did a, a Netflix series for two seasons and uh, called Real Rob, and I just said, I wanted, I thought what would be the next elevation in, um, in, in sitcoms and in entertainment, is is it? Are we really watching a reality thing here, or was it? Or is it this really happening? But I said it's scripted and still shot in a beautiful way, though. I, yeah. I don't want to watch a reality show. I want to watch something that's shot and edited well with music, and that's that's written. And yeah. so and that's the whole point of like of of doing something is to write it because like yours is scripted, right? I don't really know what mine is to be honest. <laughs> It, I, I would be very, I mean, I, I know that this is not the branding Netflix is looking for. We started with <laughs> one thing. Uh, we found out that that was a tad bit undoable. <laughs> and then yeah. we, we did another thing. And, and then in the process of doing that third thing, I think we figured out what the show was. And, and it's just, it's, it's, I don't know what it is, to be honest with you. It's just very, very funny. Like, it's, it's really funny for me. But it's also like very, I will say, very cancelable at times. Uh, in yeah. every episode, there are definitely things <laughs> said and done that will outrage a special interest group 100%. <laughs> I mean, we have Caitlyn Jenner on it. We have, and, and we have Caitlyn Jenner, but it's, you know, it's like, you're, it, it, I'm, it's, not, it's not this woke agenda. I don't have that in me. My, my agenda is silly. And so, yeah. It's it's just to make a joke, and so I I I, I don't dead name her or anything, but like I definitely don't pretend that she is an entity I can't ex- ex- talk to. So like yeah. so yeah, so I think everyone's kind of been concerned. I know every comic that was on it was concerned about <laughs> going to come out. Yeah, it is. Going to real- lose one episode totally. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sure. No, there were some things that were that we had to cut out of the comedy special too. Yeah. I, I was wondering, I was wondering, I was wondering what you took out. Yeah. I'll tell you sometime. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I will tell you sometime, but it, it just, it became, you know, sensitive things became, because I'm, I'm a mixed race person. So the, um, the sensitivity of things rose while we were about to, uh, you know, release this, um, all the sensitivities and people, you know, losing their minds and, yeah. you know, and rightfully, rightfully so they were upset. So people were upset. And, uh, so we just had to just be conservative and, and it's like, again, you have like your joke and it's, Oh, that's really funny. But then you have people who are like, it's an empire. It's a, you know, this is a, uh, you know, thousands of people work there. And so there, there are other things that are separate from your, uh, um, you know, you have to, you have to have, have those considerations. That's why I do like, like all I ever wanted to be was like, truthfully, just a character actor and like, they're not like, um, just to play different characters and, 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 and have a career like that. But unfortunately, like in show business, you know, unless you can star in movies, those, those little roles don't pay anymore. 
And so those, as far as like, I'm talking about like, you know, um, if you look at, you know, the Humphrey Bogart movies like Casablanca and you see Peter Lorre, like, you know, I need the papers of transit. I need those. I have to have them. The fat man has the papers, you know. And the, I used to do all those. I did every voice in that movie. So I like, you know, with Humphrey Bogart, you know, we said a lot of great things last night. And you said, I would do the thing from now on. I've done a lot of thinking since. So as my childhood, I would just get a tape recorder and just record all these things, try to do all the voices. And so they would teach me to do it. And it took a while to figure it out. And then you'd get like one or two words and then you'd be able to figure out, you know, like for Sean Connery, it was like, you know, I saw he did a commercial for, he was advertising some movie and it was on the news because it was like, it's not about Japan bashing. And I was like, bashing, that's a good way to say, it. get that, uh, that accent, that Scottish broke bashing. So, I mean, the, so that was the, the fun stuff to do. And, uh, you're but so, you're so good at little things. Like the little things, like this sounds so silly. I must have watched you clear a regulator on the wrong Missy. That just you clearing a regulator and just lit. It was so funny and it was so silly that I was like, fucking, do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, I know, but there was the wrong Missy. And the thing about that was, <clears throat> I, you know, David Spade and I, we hadn't worked together in a few years. But like from those SNL days, you know, you're up there. You're only as good as the guy you're with. So you always support each other. See where they go. Go with them. <clears throat> and I remember um, I talked to the prop guy. I said, I'm in charge of the boat. I need the dive equipment. And he said, you, have, you got a tank on you and a regulator? And he said, yeah. And he looked at me. Do you want it to work? He's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to use it. I need it. You know? Yeah. And so um, I just, David came over. and It was just this thing where you don't think about it too much. Just go with it and see where it leads. And I just saw him out of the corner of his eye. And I just, I know that, that, that thing's like, don't laugh and kill it. I just saw his, when he stiffens up like that, he's like, don't laugh. This could be really working. Go with it. It's just this body language. And he knows that I'm doing a bit and whatever. And I just saw, as soon as he turned, I went like, I got it. You know? And it's just like, ah. and then like, I, I tried to put the thing so, in my mouth and his mouth. You know? It was so funny because I, and this, I know this is going to sound like, uh, like really Bert, but at that moment, I, I did not know what to expect out of the wrong Missy. I didn't know if I'd like it or not. I, I know that I love David Spade. I really do. But I didn't know if I was going to like the movie. And I, I was laughing so hard at that movie from beginning to end. But it was things like, I, I felt like I was like, oh, this is what's important about this group of guys is that they're sitting on a boat and they can make just clear, clearing a regulator, which you've seen everyone do. It's happened on every fucking dive trip. The guy goes, yeah, you're good. You're good. And, and everyone subtly goes, oh, God, that's going in my mouth next. Oh. And, but the two of you doing that and you doing it, it was, and I thought this is what's important about comedy is, is that these, were, these relationships have been uh, matured over so long of a time that they're making little things funny that, you could never write into a script. You could never say, like, here, hey, by the way, this is something that, this is, like, one of the funny, this will be great in a trailer. This will be great. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I was like, God damn it, man. And that's why I got so excited to watch your special, was that one little moment I went, I, and, I, and, it, and it goes back to that Marin interview where I'm listening to you going, God damn it, I forgot he started as a stand-up. Oh, You've thank had such you. an insanely diverse career that you go, I forgot. He's just a guy who's at the beginning wants to laugh and wants people to laugh, but laughter's it. That's it. Laughter's the king, man. It, it's the, that's the thing. For anybody who, you know, the Academy Awards, the one thing they want when they get up there, when they go to present or give an award, they want to get a laugh because comedy is, is and always will be king. You know, it's um, the, the thing in the stand up special that, 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 that Adam Sandler likes the most that I did in the Asian Mama Mexican Kids was um, as I'm, you know, the, the Korean, I was doing uh, some shows for the American military in, J in, in Japan and Korea. When I was in Korea, I got like, you get Korean, uh, you know, barbecue. And like, uh, what are we going to get today? Well, it's Korean barbecue. And they said, well, I just had it. And they said, well, let's get it again. And then we're going to go again. And they're like, and every time they bring the stuff out and they're not like cooking it for you. And I went like, and it's the first time, you know, and I would have never thought of that joke unless I would have been to it, you know three times in the same day, Korean barbecue. Yeah. And then, 
And he said, uh, he said, are you, you know, what do I, he said, I was basically asking how long do I cook this? And he went, uh, you, you, you cook it, you, you cook it. And I went like, all right. And then that was it. And then I went on stage that night and I started talking about, you know, I'd hate to be at a, you know, you cook it. You go to the Korean barbecue, you go, you cook it. No, you, you cook it. Hey, I'm paying 30 bucks to come here. You cook it. You cook it. I hate to go to a Korean whorehouse, you know, no. Hey, yeah, yeah. Oh, come on in. This is the room where you, 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 you suck your own dick. You suck it. You suck it. You suck it. And, um, and I remember, and then I, I did a little funny walk away as I walked away, you know, like, you know, and, and, um, and I remember that's what Adam laughed the hardest at. <laughs> so it's the little tiny things that you can put in that make it. Oh, that, that, that stuck in my head. We, we had, we had, I just got back from this thing and we had all our friends wanted to get together, but they want to stay socially distant. So we had four stations four it was three families, three stations set up of yeah. Korean barbecue outside. <laughs> so you were with your family, another table with their family, another table with their family. Good, yeah. it, was, it was close enough. Where we were all still talking. And, um, and I could not stop saying that you cook it. And then I kept, I, I started adding on to that joke going, it's such an irresponsible way to cook to say, because my daughter's eating pork belly basically raw. And I'm like, <laughs> you should not be cooking this fucking pork belly. I know. I know. It, it, does, it doesn't seem like it, it's, it should be legal. It's funny that that stuck in my head and I'm sitting there doing, I'm having Korean barbecue at our friend's house. They got a little, uh, little grill out and it was, and I kept going, no, it, that's, fucking hilarious that's fucking great you know the so, uh in chinatown there was a uh right below, in san francisco right below where i used to live a um you can go down there and they you can order turtle and they but you can't take the turtle out of the store they had to kill the turtle right there and it's, it's like and i've had turtle soup and it's good and everything but like i also like it's something there's something so cute you just i i don't want to eat it anymore you know but they like and so i just walk in and I see this, this turtle being brought up and they just take his head like this and go, <laughs> you know, this is another level of cruelty in Chinese food. And like the ducks, they not only kill the duck, but then they, they hang him you know, <laughs> in the front of the store. Like, you know, it's like, it's like a, a duck a Holocaust, you know. I can imagine killing a turtle myself. <laughs> yeah. So, the, so, so, uh, so what, what's the plans for touring? Do you guys know when you'll go back out? I just so funny you mentioned that because I just literally said because I just had work. Um, it's funny, but I'm not promoting any of my gigs that I got coming up just because I don't want any shit from people, you know. But I know that you're doing. How are those? It's because of you that I did this car show with David Spade. They said, you know, Bert's doing it. They said, Bert's oh, yeah. doing what? A car show. He asked me to do a car show. Oh, uh, David, dude. David Spade. I let me tell you something. It's uh, there's a lot. I will say this for any comic because I know a bunch of comics probably listening. But um, it is it. They need to be run right, like in those car shows. You guys were in Irvine, or where Ooh, were you? Um, Ventura. I saw that. I, I saw where you guys were. The ones in the middle of the country are the best. The best oh, one in the really world is yeah. in Butler, Pennsylvania. The ones in the middle of the country because, um, especially like uh, I'm I'm trying to think. Ohio's are pretty good because they set up these big tailgates at the back of the trucks anywhere where they, that's got trucks. Because they oh, bring all the yeah. shit, the trucks, back into the thing, set up their little area. There's a great one in uh, in um, oh, right Cape down. Cod that they've actually created little spaces for you to be. But um, I can give you all the great ones to do. Yes, and they're fun as shit. And you, and if you let everyone know, come out, stay socially dif- distant, tailgate, have a good time, bring beer. Even if they say don't bring beer, bring beer, bring cocktails, bring weed. Yeah. Do what you're going to do. Yeah. And, but, and I was very clear up front. I said, I'm doing this because I want you guys to be able to get out of your house. But I also want people like myself who would not probably get out of the car. I want them to be able to enjoy it as well so that yeah. everyone yeah. can kind of regulate themselves. They are fucking great. I leave again in a week to do another tour. Um, and it's probably my last one of the year. But I've done, I've done now. This will be my third tour. And I, I love it. But there's, look, there's a lot of parts. Like I had to figure out a lot of things like lightning shows up every now and then. And I've done yeah. shows where there's lightning in the background. Two shows in some places aren't great because the second show didn't start till one in the morning <laughs> and you're like, Oh God, but I, know. I love them. I, I have a blast. You can hear him laughing because oh, for us yeah. it was like, eh, eh, you know, oh, 
that's the other thing is you got you got to set up the rules to it because they don't know the rules. Is you got to say like, like I did one in Pennsylvania. It was like four thousand people, and I said, bring. I said before this, I said, bring your trucks, bring your vans, bring the car of the group of people that you're in that is the most fun to be in, and okay. set up your station there. And so then basically everyone's out of their car. They're still in their space, but yeah. they're like out and open. And then you hear the laughter. If they're in your car, in their cars, like straight up in their cars, you won't be able to hear anything. <laughs> I just, I won't do those. I, I did this one. It's so funny, but I was, I did the, um, did the car show. Eh, 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 you know, eh, yeah. And that's, I don't know. Am I killing? I don't know. And then I, I did a joke once and it was a slight delay. And I heard you go, eh. I think I'm getting heckled. I'm getting heckled right now. <laughs> on the way home, I swear to God, on the way home, I'm driving home, and you know, I was drinking a little on stage, so I was a little buzz, which I probably shouldn't have been driving. But I'm driving home, and um, I just, you know, I, th- I think I got this. And so I, I cut some guy off, and he went like, and he, he honked at me like, eh, and I went, hey, that guy <laughs> was you. at the show. <laughs> I think that guy was at the show. Yeah. So anyway. there's, um, I tell you, man, I'll, uh, I'll. I'll get I'll get y'all's no I'll get your number and I'll text you, you the ones that are um that are really fun. There's one in North Carolina that's out of this world, Columbus, and there okay. and it's also you can't you can't have too big of a venue. Like I've done some that are like really massive, okay. and you don't want to disconnect. You want it. Butler, Pennsylvania, Starlight is the greatest drive-in to do a show at in the world. Okay. Okay. In the world, it's carved into a mountain. So it's tiered up. So everyone sees the stage. They've got three screens. It's Butler, Pennsylvania is the best one okay. I've ever done, without a wow. doubt. Butler's got um, really uh, interesting stories from the people who live in Butler. But um, I was just, I'm trying to think of exactly the story about um, some guy who broke into his own mom's home or something. It's a, some crazy story from 20 years ago. Okay, I'm going to do it. I'll yeah. check it out. I'll get, I'll, so, get, I'll, give, I'll get you my, my info through, uh, through your people. I'll, I'll send it to you. Well, good luck with this show. I mean, you're making the announcement this week? Uh, I think I've announced it. We just, we just added a bunch of shows. Oh, um, no, but you're, you know, but you're doing the, this TV show for Netflix. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, Dude, that's huge. Netflix think, has like the biggest pull of an audience. Well, the announcement's today at 4 p.m. Wow. Well, it's coming up 4 p.m. on the East Coast, 33 oh, yeah. minutes. Hey, listen, if it's good, I'll hit you up to do season two. Dude, you got it. I'd love it. It's, it's the a, best. It's a fun – We I just basically took comics into the woods at, to this cabin, and we just partied for a day. We did some <laughs> shit, partied, and then ended up <laughs> by a fire Fantastic. talking about it. And it was it – was, there were no rules, so comics – you know, you know how you give a comic no rules and they'll give you way more than you ever need. <laughs> and then and then you get the text the next day like you're not using all that, are you? And you're like <laughs> <laughs> I know. That was the thing like, you know, I would do something to make uh, Adam laugh in a movie like in 51st Dates. I just told the prop guy, I said, "Get me a joint." And uh, and so I know, you know, cuz what happened was every guy that I knew uh, you know, growing up when I spent summers in Hawaii, they would wear these short shorts and a t-shirt. And that's all you needed because that was the weather every day. And, uh, and then even when they get older, they're still wearing the same shit, but they don't have the same body anymore. So yeah. there's more hanging out. There. So I thought, I, I thought that was funny. So I had my character wear that. And then, uh, so I said, give me a joint. And so I put it, uh, and I, just to make Adam laugh, I literally put it in my ass crack. And then I just, you know, I didn't tell him. And so I just, I get up to leave, you know, and I just show him my ass, you know, the joint in my ass. And then, uh, and he kept it in the movie. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's great, man. So. Well, listen, I'm going to go get a root canal. So you are uh, today. Fuck yeah. I'm, I, I got a, I had a really bad toothache at the beginning of quarantine and it was a root canal. And then I'm very, I'm very much like get it out of my face and then I won't want to deal with it. And it, I haven't got it repacked in now three months, four months. Let me just suggest this. Maybe not a root canal. Maybe do the take a titanium thing. I know it's painful. Yeah. Do it. Yeah, because what other what other surgery do they do where they take something dead? They don't take out your your appendix and leave it something dead in you. They yeah. leave you something dead in your. You have ten thousand and you have ten thousand little capillaries, and it creates some bacteria. So I'll just tell you this: a friend of mine had a lot of problems, uh, uh, like uh, headaches and all, migraines and everything. And she took a couple of those and put titanium things. She has 
no problems after that. I mean, I have I have root canals that I've had no problem, but I'm just suggesting that's just something you can think about. You have I'm other root canals? Z- I'm taking a Xanax right now. I have I got hit in the mouth with a baseball bat when I was 11, and I have 26 fake teeth. So I have so many root canals, it's ridiculous. I had so many root canals at one point, they took my gum off and lifted my gum up and just cleaned out the roots and then sewed my gum back down. Wow. But they, I mean, put, it's, they put your own teeth back in. My own teeth, kind of. I mean, if you saw an x-ray of what my real teeth look like, they are sh- they're all shattered, and so everything's kind of crowns and veneers. You get, oh, my God. Well, thank God they got good people doing it. I guess. You have no pain? You have headaches or anything now? No, no, I'm good. I'm good. I get, I, I'm weird though. Like I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't like, I feel like I bounce back really quick because I party so much. <laughs> but like if I don't, if I don't drink for two days, I feel superhuman. <laughs> well, I know, but you must work out though to, to get that. I, well, yeah, I work, I work out a lot, but I'm still fat because I like to party. So yeah. Well, so. you can do that in your forties. Yeah. I'm, I'm, fi- I'm, I'm 56, man. I tell you at this point, I say, I, I swear, like I was like, I remember I had a couple, a uh, couple of, like I'll have a couple of glasses of wine, but I remember I had too much, and I felt like shit. Like, it was the next day. It was like the entire day, and then the next day, and I said, "Why am I screwing up several days over this?" You know. Yeah. But you got to enjoy your life too. So. Well, dude, thank you for doing this. Congratulations on the special. Thank um, you. what a beautiful way to end it. It really was. It was like I, you look at that and you're like, "God damn it, man!" That was like it was perfect with the whole family up there. Thank you. Um, you know, I, what, you know, as, as, as things go on, as time goes on, you realize how special it is and how short it is, you know, the, the career and you never know when it's going to happen again. And it's just nice to bring everybody up and say hi and get like, look, come on, I want to include people. And as I, whatever I end up doing the coming up next, I'm going to try to do a couple of movies and see if that happens or another TV series. But I, I want to just, uh, it's nice to include my family. That's what's so nice about the Real Rob TV show. I get to work with my actual wife. We wrote it together, did it together, and we made the whole first season, and we sold it to Netflix, and then they paid for season two. It was, it was amazing. So uh, it, was, it was one of those incredible things. But it's quick, man. It flies by, so you got to enjoy it. Have fun. Yeah, with yeah, it. Ma- I'm, I'm panicking now. <laughs> go, 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 go. Enjoy. I love it. And go for season two, and I'll see you on that one. Awesome, Rob. Thank you so much for doing this, brother. Congrats. All the best. Thank you, Bert. It's a pleasure. Oh, thank you, brother. Right. Take care. See you now.